So I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Absolutely. Well, I, um, uh, Sharon and I were talking uh, today about how we were going to do this, and, and I put together uh, a few questions, um, and I wanted to start with just giving a little bit of background uh, on you. Um, so Sharon's work uh, delves into socio-political uh, concerns, moving outward from the personal to the wider communities of gender, tribe, country, and finally universal. And I and, and don't think that I made all that up. It's <laughs> from, from her, her own words. Um, but I think that really gets to why I felt there was a connection between some of the work you're doing and you're talking about here and the broader Heroes Recovery Movement that we felt that we have pioneered. Um, and so in work, the way that we're trying to bring the message that addiction is a disease and that mental health issues should not be hidden away, they should be um, talked about in general, I felt like some of these things that you're talking about, we'll get into the questions, are really challenging people to, like, let's have a conversation about it, whether it's about women's and gender uh, roles or whether it's about addiction and mental health. So I really thought it really went well. Um, and you, by looking at those issues um, as an individual who is part of these larger communities, that you create this multi-perspective, which I think is really important. Um, and I think for me, it resonated with me that that you can come apart as a mother, you know, as, as a woman, as a mother, as somebody um, who has a facial trauma. And I think that having that multi-perspective makes it so powerful. Um, Cher holds a BFA in painting from MTSU. Um, and you've also studied at the Santa Fe College of Art and the Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Uh, while living uh, in Florida, uh, you were also nominated for Bravo Channel's uh, Champion of Arts Award. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Um, I wanted to start off with, you stated that you know a piece is complete when you reach a sense of quiet within the process. This statement stuck with me on how many people struggling with addiction come to terms with their disease by achieving some sense of quiet in their lives. Are there any methods or approaches that you practice in finding your quiet? I think that art making is just reacting to an image or an object so it's a conversation with an object I usually do a lot of research before I actually start art making which is a completely different process than a lot of other artists um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a writer or an artist um, this is the thing that my sister's the writer she's the poet so then I kind of was the artist and amazingly we're actually both both poets and artists of course um, but so I do a lot of research and then I start making the work I start collecting the I guess the materials for it um, and then it happens as I'm thinking about it and if my soul isn't like feeling like it's right there's just a lot of clutter in my brain so I know it's right when a, fe a piece clicks in and it's quiet if that makes any sense right, right. but but when there's no more conversation going on in my head or no more interaction with the piece, then it's done. Do you ever show a piece and you think it's quiet, you show a piece and then decide it's not quiet and you want to rework it? No. Um, it's like they're all different children. They all have their own paths in life. I've done what I can with them and then I set them off on the ocean and they're going to float away. Right. I don't No, There's no, no. Gotcha. Good. I'm done with them. Right? <laughs> 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 we're done with our children. <laughs> now I will say that like a lot of times my process on one piece will lead to a different process on the next piece, and they're certainly related. You know, you can tell they're cousins. Right. But yeah, I don't rework work. It's its own thing. It's its own identity. Right. Right. Um, your work with with imagery of afterburns of Hiroshima survivors really connected uh, with the scarring and branding, uh, really connected with me, with the scarring and the branding of people in recovery. Um, do you think your work um, is symbolic to the suffering, or do you envision it as transformative for the victim? I think it's both. Um, this is not work that I'm showing here, but I have these new paintings and sculptures that are inspired by um, the afterburns of Hiroshima and Nagasaki victims and literally the kimono patterns would be burned onto the people's bodies or there's an image of a girl that had um, a school bag on and it was strapped over her body and it was a white strap 
And so that um, deflected the radiation. And so she had a perfectly pink skin there, but everything else was black and scarred and bubbly. And, um, and I took it immediately to emotional scarring um, of childhood or, or whatever trauma. Um, and my thing was just to be a witness more than anything else and to record it, but record it in a beautiful way that it's not just focusing on the politics of it, you know, more about just the human experience of this horrific thing, not saying who's right, who's wrong. It, it was more to be a witness or a journalist in a way. Right, right. Is that answering your no, question? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, yeah, and so I actually like to get a conversation going, but not answer your question as a viewer. You know, I want you to bring your own biography and biology to the experience of looking at the art. I don't mind like explaining to you where I was, but I actually want you to do some of the work and not like spoon feed you the answer. Right. Um, so I like to like give a little fact and then let it be an experience Excellent. as you view it. Right, right. Um, your work, and, and this is kind of related to the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki project, sometimes deals with unpopular ideas how do you stay inspired? Well, as a child, I was taught not to speak, and I wasn't allowed to have a voice. So that's one of my goals in life, is to show people that they each have their own voice, and they're worthy to speak their words. And I don't buy that anybody should oppress anything. Um, I know that's what hurts people, the repression and oppression. And so that's actually my theme, is to say the unspeakable, if that's what needs to be said. Right, right. Um, your work at times has challenged traditional roles of women. Do you see your work as challenging the traditional role of people suffering with mental health challenges or addiction? I hope so. That would be like the best thing out of anything, is that people would change what they think about mental illness. Um, I think a hundred years ago, I would have ended up in the turret, you know, I would be the crazy aunt, you know, without a doubt. Um, and I have people in the family that think I'm pretty much out there, you know, crazy. Um, but that's okay, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experiences in, in my life that would lead one to be crazy, completely insane. Um, but I've chosen to deal with them, to heal, specifically, like, I'll talk about it if I need to talk about it, to get over it. It's part of the process. And um, I lost my train of thought. Where are we going? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, where were we going with that? No, we're okay. just talking about, you know, how you see, you know, with your work. Oh, um, do I mind being... Right. Right. Um, no, let's shine a light on it. You know, like let's be the spotlight and I feel like I'm speaking on behalf of women that can't speak for themselves and not just women but abused children, S people that have tried to commit suicide that it didn't work. Like I'm just really bad at it. I was unsuccessful when I was seven years old. I was not good at committing suicide. Right. You know, and so if that shines a light on children in emergency rooms that people think they were drowning, probably maybe they jumped into the deep end not knowing how to swim, which is what I did and got really pissed when somebody pulled them out, right. you know? So, I don't mind shining the spotlight on that. Right, good. good. I'm willing to be the land of slaughter, if that's what they want. Well, hopefully we won't be doing any slaughtering. <laughs> You're in a friendly audience. Um, your one-sentence statement I found really fascinating. I put together broken things. Um, it's powerful, it's simple, and it's an expressive description of what you do. How did you arrive at such a simple way to express kind of your complex role. Okay, so while you're becoming this whatever official artist, you know, the big thing is like you have to have your artist statement and you know, or then you have people that like your work needs to speak for itself, but then you're in situations a lot of time with non-artists and they ask you what you do. And so do you have a six word thing to answer that or like a one line artist statement? And so I actually worked really hard at figuring this out. I probably worked on it for six months. Wow. And I literally sat up in bed one night and was like, I put broken things back together. That was it, that was yeah. done. And then I actually got to use it. Um, I was in art, not Art Basel, but the Pool Art Fair in Miami a few years ago. 
And flying down there, had this big conversation with the guy at the airport, you know, sitting there waiting during a layover. And he says, what do you do? And I'm like, I had it ready. And I was like so excited. Like I could totally answer him in one sentence, you know, and right. it was great. So yeah. it worked for me really well. Yeah. And I feel like it's emotional. Emotionally, I'm always putting myself back together. Right. With artwork, I like to deconstruct and put things back together, right. you know, and it's just kind of like a universal statement like the theme of my life kind of you know yeah have you been approached by people that have been to your shows and connected with you um who might be struggling with their own you know issues absolutely um the piece you made your bed mm -hmm. um i actually made that for a women's history month show at a museum and um I saw some old ladies looking at it and like they were just enamored. I mean, they were looking at every piece of fabric and everything and I went up and I was just like, I'm so glad you made it and you know, I'm glad you're enjoying the work and everything and they said, well, you know, I just read your artist statement and, and my artist statement was about um, my life, I guess, in a way and struggle with anxiety and depression and she said, well, you know, this spoke to me because I once went to bed and, and I guess I was depressed and I was like, oh, you know, and she said, yes. Two of my sons died in Vietnam, and after the second son died, I went to bed. And I said, well, you know, they say that's one of the best things you can do to heal yourself is to sleep. She goes, no, I went to bed for two years. And so I guess for me, that was like, that's why I do this work, you know. And she says, I've never talked about it in, what, 40 years? This yeah. was just a couple of years ago. You know, so I felt like that was like a really one-on-one -on -one connection that I had with her at that point, right. you know. And I know that she felt accepted you know, and supportive that that's what she needed to do right. when her second son died. So, yes. I think that's what the uh, inspiration that, that keeps uh, us continuing to push ahead with, with heroes and doing these different events, you know, promoting artist talk like this, doing 6Ks, and it's because we keep hearing these personal stories mm -hmm. and they share them every day, you know, on the site. And it's like, we can't stop now. I mean, so many people are starting to connect and find out. And I, I kind of get a sense from being at your show, even that very first one, that, you know, people are really going to, they're, 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 there's so many people out there and it's just another interesting way to connect with people. And I, and I, I envision that people will probably come up to you and, like want to pull you to the side like we did, like what to find out what's going on. And yeah, and I'm totally about having an authentic conversation. Right. So, you know, we get right to the bone marrow really right, quick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, uh, the You Made Your Bed series, um, which is, is so impressive to look at it, you know, especially when you see all of them together. Um, and it was in the top 10 women artists of Tennessee exhibition, mm -hmm. ex exhibition at the Customs House. Yes. Um, did you, and, and, I, and this question, which you kind of just answered, but um, did you receive a lot of personal testimonies, um, you know, at that at that show? Another one you share with the woman. Yes. So, um, and also, there's an editor of the newspaper up there, and she did a one-on-one -on -one interview with me, and, and we're still actually friends. And she had just had her first child, mm -hmm. and was kind of suffering some postpartum depression and struggling with going back to work, and like. Who was she, this professional woman, when she just wanted to stay home with her baby? Right. You know, and I mean, that's just one little example of, right. you know, connections that I've made, you know, through things. Good, good. <laughs> well, I wanted to take just a minute and add, and open up for any questions uh, from the audience, too, about about any of your work they've seen here tonight or, uh, or some of the things we may have talked about here. Any questions, anything you're dying to know? <laughs> you mentioned that. Um, that had to do with the emails, the shredded oh, email. Yes. Eat your and words. you were talking about how that was kind of art therapy for you. Do you teach art therapy? Have you done that with other people? Or are you, you mainly do your own artwork and that's your expression? So mostly it's personal, although I believe very strongly in art therapy. It's basically just doing therapy, therapy sessions with art making. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that you and then this is not a professional statement, but I don't think that you have to be a degree person to help somebody work through some art therapy. My sister and I have done a lot of things together or back and forth, you know, that has to do with art therapy. She actually studied art therapy um, as a graduate student. Um, and I think it just became natural to me once I started to express who I was, once I felt like I found my voice, to do it in the 3D world. Um, and I think sometimes it's easier for me to handle things in the 3D world than like 
black and white ink, you know, because then black and white ink is kind of concrete, if that makes any sense. And I feel like I have more control over the future of the feeling in the 3D world. Right. Um, I think some art therapy can be really hokey. I mean, we've had this conversation, like, if you give a patient glue and a magazine, you're going to get a crappy collage. If you give them some new pastels and some nice illustration board and a prompt, they're going to blow your mind. And so I think that that's something that needs to be dealt with. I, I think it's better to have an artist working with a therapist than a therapist that isn't in any way an artist. Um, I, I feel like I'm a really good teacher. I've been a teacher before. And I feel like that job is to midwife the emotions from somebody and help them nurture those emotions versus just um, make something pretty to hang on the wall. Like, and, and I've had people be, why don't you just paint roses? You know, it's like, well, I haven't had a pretty life, so I'm not gonna paint roses. Sorry, go to Walmart, you know? Not, not coming from me, it's not what comes up. So, yeah. Well said. <laughs> <clears throat> Anybody else have a question? I, I actually have a comment. Um, I, the, we first talked about that quiet place when you know something is finished. Because um, I'm an artist too, and it's a difficult to always know that. And it got me thinking about also art as a meditative practice. Yes. And how it's a cleansing practice. I mean, Get it's it like being baptized, baptized yeah. really, in it's a like, way. Yeah, you, yeah, you get it, you know, you, you feel like cleansed. And, but I, I just thought that was very uh, poignant to, to bring that pot that up. The, the, the idea of all the clutter and, and the process that you go through to find that what that object's going to be. And then when you get there, it's just like... Yes. I love that. That's yes. really beautiful. And, and that's not to say that I've never struggled with a piece, because I have struggled with pieces before. Um, and another way that I handle that is that I'll have several pieces at a time, maybe even 15 pieces going mm -hmm. in different spots in the studio. And if I hit a wall with one, I can go and work, mm -hmm. you know, have a conversation with another piece. And then a lot of times I'll solve that original problem as I'm working on the others. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so I do a lot of circling, you know, back and forth to things. Great. Well, Cher, thank you so much for your thank for you. coming out and, and spending this time with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having thank me. You. All right. <laughs> That'll be like the official okay. video. I guess we need to do it. <laughs> <laughs>